Land reform and redistribution is a divisive topic for South Africans, but many of the details the arguments are based on are flawed, misunderstood, misrepresented and even false. Chief Economist of the Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa, Wandile Sihlobo, along with Professor Johan Kirsten from the Bureau for Economic Research, have penned the top five myths about land reform and farming in South Africa. Wandile Sihlobo joins us now to unpack what is fact and what is not. Very welcome uh, to you, Wandile. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me on. So let's... Let's start with the basic. Uh, you say there are a number of myths about farmland and commercial agriculture that prevent interested parties from reaching a common understanding of the realities we face around the issues of land reform. But before we even get to those five myths as you see them, um, before we get to the merits of the who and the how, there are also misconceptions about the what, the amount of suitable land available for crop farming that we have at our disposal. What are the common beliefs and what are the facts? Yeah, absolutely, um, Ali, because I mean, I think, and it's understandable that everyone talks about agriculture and uh, facts get lost in, in the emotions because we drive around the country and we see all of these farms and we're thinking, perhaps maybe one can farm anywhere in South Africa. But the reality is we are a country that is of a size of around about 120 million hectares, if you look at South Africa in totality. And uh, the land that is for farming out of that is around about 77 million hectares of that. But if you were to dissect it and say, what can actually be farmed in there? You'll find that what you can do on really crop farming, it could be in an area of around about 20, 25% of that 77 uh, million hectares. And roughly 50% of that, um, uh, that's the land that is almost similar to what you see in the Karoo, where you can graze animal, but it's not as that fertile. So there are those dynamics, which I think when we talk about farming, we perhaps maybe have to have a, a deeper appreciation of them that we cannot farm anywhere. And the economic value of all of this land is not equal across South Africa. That also means we have to be a lot more careful or selective about how we redistribute the land and which land we redistribute for which purposes. Um, so, so the first of those five myths, as you point out uh, in this article, is that 40,000 white farmers own 80% of all South Africa's land. And you point out two problems with that belief, uh, both the number of white farmers and the percentage of land. So just tell us what the reality is. Absolutely. I mean, what you tend to hear when we dis discuss land reform is that we have uh, these 40,000 uh, white farmers that own a large part of South Africa's land. But what we find when we look at the numbers is that firstly, um, there's roughly just around about um, 41,000, if you were to put all of that, farming units, not farmers uh, per se as in individuals. Of course, those farming units, some could be individuals, some could be various entities, but I think the proper way is to consider them as the, as the, as the farming units. And we find that when we're using some of the work, for example, the census uh, of uh, agricultural statistics of 2017 um, really details and, and, and paints that picture quite nicely in, 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 in South Africa. But then when you begin then to say how much of land do they really own um, in South Africa or how big are those farming units? Those farming units are around about 61 million hectares. Now, we are a country that is about 120 million hectares, as I said at the start, 61 million hectares, that's about half of South Africa. Mm -hmm. But of course, when you're focusing really on agriculture, that puts you somewhere around about 78% of South Africa's farmland. But the popular number is always something that is north of 80%, and it's usually of individual farmers. But I think the proper way of putting it is viewing them as farming units. So the individuals behind those farming units the number is not quite clear. It could be slightly less or it could be slightly more than that. You identify another myth that uh, finds itself in the background of that statement, and that is that there's a misperception about commercial agriculture as a dominantly white enterprise. What are the dangers around these misconceptions when it comes to public debate around land reform and how we view progress that's been made already? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of the things are only around about that number is the fact that, uh, you know, there's a confusion in South Africa between scale and uh, um, and, and actually the, the actual enterprises on the size of land, uh, where people say, look, uh, South Africa's agriculture is dominated by these big commercial uh, farmers. But I think uh, the proper way of looking into this, because you may be a commercial farmer having a larger turnover farming at uh, 10 hectares in KZN than someone who's doing that at 100 hectares in the Karoo. So land size per se, when you're looking at a commercial basis or value basis, might not be an appropriate way of looking into these things so it's better to use a turnover and if you are then to agree and go with the turnover perspective that uh, the article from Professor Ivan Kirsten and I uh, attempts to do you find that uh, the large-scale farming which would be those that I would categorize with a turnover that is just uh, north of 22 million um, uh, rand you find that those are just under 3,000 um, uh, farms a majority of the South African farms uh, they are actually micro and smallholder farming if you were to categorize with a turnover uh, perspective. And by commercial here, really describing it as those farmers that are able, of course, to produce and sell stuff to the market. So I think that's the, the view there where we can perhaps maybe all agree that South African farmers are not as that big if we are viewing them um, it, from a turnover perspective. But of course, the land sizes may differ. And I guess the other point here, which we didn't really outline in the article, which I think it's important to, to, to put forward, is that if you look at those farming numbers that I was talking about, about just uh, around about uh, uh, over 40,000 uh, farming units, um, about 48% of those, they have a turnover that is less than 5 million rands uh, of that. So that just tells you that these are not the big farms uh, uh, per se. And I guess, uh, Ali, it's also appropriate in this point to add just one point to say, when we talk about that number of 40,000, we are not talking about all of the commercial farming or all of the farming activity that happens in South Africa. Because when you look at the numbers closely, you realize that that 40,000 comes from the farmers that are registered to pay tax, which mm -hmm. means those that have a turnover that is just over half a million are rent. But there is nearly 200,000 farmers that have a turnover that is less than that, which are not calculated. So when you consider the farming sector in totality, then the number is quite large of the people that are involved in agriculture. So in this article, you then go on to address two points. I want to... Uh, just for the sake of time, skip over those briefly and, and skip forward to the misconception that South Africa has only redistributed 8% of farmland to black farmers. How much land has in actual fact been redistributed by your calculations and why the deliberate misinformation on the part of many interested parties about these actual figures? And I think it's, uh, I mean, I would sympathize with, with, with many South Africans because the, South Africa doesn't really have um, an appropriate good um, uh, data set that is a one portal where everyone can go and quickly click um, mm. and see these numbers. Even ourselves as academics, we had to try then to aggregate these numbers from various sources. But what we find, um, which we present in the paper, is that um, if you were to look, take, for example, the 30% target that the ANC talked about in its ready-to-govern document early on in 1994 or a few years before that, where that, and you say, where are we today towards that 30% target that was put in there? You find that we are roughly at 24% now, closer to that. So when people talk about 8%, we're pretty much underestimating the progress that has been made. And I guess one of the ways of explaining um, that, that it has a lot to do with the fact that some of the land that has been di distributed, particularly under what we call the proactive land acquisition strategy by the government, has not really been uh, utilized uh, 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 fruitfully by, by those that have benefited uh, from it. And part of the story has a lot to do with that land rights and land governance remain weak. We need long-term title, uh, tradable long leases, long-term leases there that are tradable or title deeds. And that, I think, it will unlock some bit of capital and investment 
into that land. And of course, a proper selection of the beneficiaries would also be a useful thing to do. And I think all of those then could begin to unlock the economic value and people could feel the impact of that progress. But for now, when we present it as statistics and they are not used um, uh, pro productively, it feels like it's, it's imaginary. But I think if you look at the statistics, we've done uh, fairly better as a country in land reform than uh, the number that we put. But that doesn't mean land reform uh, should end. Of course, mm. it's an important developmental policy and it should progress, but I think it should be based on sound numbers. So during these debates that often uh, get uh, very heated, get very emotional, and in some cases, to be honest, get quite ugly. Expropriation, nationalization, these are extreme concepts that are uh, thrown into that debate that, uh, that makes it quite emotional. As an economist, um, you have the benefit of being able to draw yourself to a degree out of that emotion and look at it from a practical um, economic point of view. Um, while no one is suggesting that we should ignore the injustices of the past, um, we should be compelled by our own conscience, conscience and by desire for true inclusive progress uh, to base arguments and analyses on fact. So with that context, where do you as an economist feel we are on expropriation without compensation at the moment in South Africa? I think, I mean, um, as I pointed out in uh, even in my book, uh, Finding Common Ground, uh, in my uh, personal analysis, that was not um, an, an appropriate policy um, if to, to take forward to, to drive land reform. Because my thinking is, of course, land reform addresses two things. You have restorative justice, but you also have the economic uh, imperatives. Because as a country, we start with problems of about um, unemployment, uh, inequality, uh, and low grow, uh, jobs um, uh, uh, and employment. So you have to say that in every policy that you're taking, how do you drive economic growth while still dealing with the restorative um, justice? And I think we have some policy tools that can uh, assist us in pushing uh, land reform forward without actually going the expropriation route. Because we have to understand also to say the progress that is not at a desired pace although I argue that it's somewhere around about 24% um, of the 30% that was a target, but why has it not been much faster? And if you read many works coming out of Tembeka Ngulgai Tobi, Ruth Hall, Nick Fink, Johan Kirsten, many other people that are studying land reform in South Africa, they allude to issues of corruption, they allude to issues of uh, capacity in the, in the state, um, and of course, uh, that corruption runs between the state and the private sector. Those are some of the leakages that can be closed. But then in the process, we should be saying, going forward, what are some of the tools that can help us in driving land reform? And I think what the president talked about when he mentioned a land reform agency as something that can drive redistribution, it's something we should take seriously and look forward to say, what are the details of it? Can it really assist us in a more productive way? And I think those are some of the ideas we should explore. And in fact, some of those are in the land reform panel that I was part of, of 2019, where we tried to outline some of the possibilities. But I think the expropriation route uh, might not be a good one um, to, to take forward in my view. The agricultural and agro-processing master plan that's been recently signed, uh, while many in the agricultural sector have acknowledged that it is by no means a cure-all um, and that it is flawed, um, however, they've said it is an agreement. It's a basis from which to work. Is there any um, part of that master plan that adequately speaks to these issues of capacitation, of corruption, of um, implementation um, of assistance tools in the development program to make land reform uh, more powerful and more uh, productive? And Lee, I had a great benefit of uh, uh, being working closely on the technical side in drafting that national uh, uh, master plan with many colleagues from BFEP, NAMC, Prof. Zukobo, and others. Um, and I must say, I mean, it's, a, it's not a perfect document, as you rightly put it, but it's very helpful. It uh, goes to agriculture per subsector by subsector, addresses all of the identifies challenges, and then proposes the solution to those challenges. And it deals with the issues around land reform to a certain extent to say, in this land that is uh, not underutilized and also in driving inclusive growth, 
what partnerships can be done, what sort of solutions uh, can be done to unlock agriculture in the former homeland, and at the same time while driving um, land reform in the in the commercial uh, agricultural uh, areas. And I think if it is done appropriately, supported by what our friends at the Land Bank had launched in their blended finance, as well as the program that I was mentioning of the Land Reform Agency, I think it can be a comprehensive push to drive us forward. But then that master plan will need um, uh, all of the role players in agriculture to do their part, the government to do their part, um, and any organized agriculture groupings to also do their part uh, and implement it effectively, deal with the corruption and the other things. And I think it gives us hope that um, it can make a dent to, to, to the progress in addressing those three pull challenges I've mentioned, which is the unemployment, uh, low economic activity, um, as well as the inequality. Wandile, before I let you go, in agriculture, we have such a very interesting polarity of potential in that on the one hand, land in South Africa is and possibly will continue to be very divisive. However, because of its potential for food security and our absolute dependence on food, um, agriculture is also an incredible unifying factor among South Africans. Looking at it from an economic point of view, what potential does agriculture um, and when land reform is practiced correctly, what potential does agriculture hold to unite South Africans and to make a better future for so many um, of our South Africans who are, let's face it, struggling beyond? And Lee, quickly, before I get to your question, I must say that um, uh, while we talk about land reform focusing on agriculture, we are all careful not to agriculturalize land reform. There's potential for uh, residential, industrial, and all of those things. But agriculture takes a greater part, which is why uh, one writes and focuses on, uh, on it. And also to your question then to say going forward, what potential can agriculture have? I mean, we are a sector that has more than doubled in value and volume terms uh, from 1994 up until to today. Um, in, uh, and if you look at it, um, at the sector at this point, and you say going forward to 2030, if we were to practice land reform in a sustainable way, uh, bring underutilized land, which is somewhere around about 2.6 million hectares into full production, uh, follow the steps of the master plan, make sure our colleagues at the land bank and the others do well in implementing the blended finance and even expand it further. Uh, I do think that we can add somewhere between uh, 15 to nearly 20 percent um, on top of the gross value of this sector. And in fact, there is compelling uh, work that has been done by our friends at the Bureau for Food and Agricultural Policy, outlining exactly how those can be done. And they've been able to take that message forward, even with the policymakers. So I'm very hopeful about the future if we implement all of this and everyone in agriculture uh, follows through and work collaboratively. Thank you so much uh, for your insights. Uh, Chief Economist from the Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa, Wandile Sehlobo, debunking some of the myths around land reform and redistribution.